All right. Hello and welcome to the power of words. I don't think it's up yet, but uh, I'm waiting for my other signal on my phone. Yes, I think we are live now. Hey, <laughs> how is everybody out there in the world? Um, oh, maybe not, but I hope we are. Somebody send me a message. Tell me if we're on live. Can you see me? Can you hear me? All right. Y'all, can you see on Facebook? Are, are we live? Ooh. Okay, here we go. Hi, thank you for joining me. My name is Teresa Davis. You are at the Arts Exchange Power of Words author panel. Uh, today, I have two of my favorite people. I have Pearl Clegg and Nick Stone, and they are black <laughs> women who are doing things black women do, which is rocking. Um, so I would like for uh, each of my author panelists to, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself before I have to read the encyclopedia of your phenomenal uh, bios. Uh, so Pearl, how are you these days? What's going on? I'm good. Um, this is a crazy time in the world and definitely in our country, but I think that's one of the moments that pushes writers and creative artists to do more, to look deeper, to find the truth, to understand how important the truth is. Um, I'm in residence right now at the Alliance Theater in Atlanta, so that I am really uh, engaged in trying to figure out how to do work outside of the conventional theater spaces um, that exist at the Alliance Theater here. Look at some of the open space that's around there. Um, I'm developing a show for the little plaza that's outside between the museum and the theater um, because I wanna still be able to do theater, but in a safe way so we can all live through this and gather and hug each other on the other side. Yeah. Okay, Nick, how about you? What's going on? Um, I'm alive. <laughs> I will say though, I find creativity to be a refuge um, at this point. So I'm just churning stuff out. I'm stuck in the house, so I might as well use the time. Um, it's been an interesting year, to say the least. I'm very used to traveling constantly. Like, you know, my work is more solid, like writing books is more solitary than, than writing plays and, and interacting with other people on a regular basis. But I was used to a lot of travel and school visits and that kind of thing. So I've had to reorganize what I do with my time. And so far that has just been create, create, create. So trying to make the most of things. Okay, what is something that, uh, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions before you share um, some of your work with us. Uh, what, what, are, what are some things that, that, I mean, of course we all took for granted the fact that we could like go to a movie theater or go to a play or hang out with friends. Like I, I, I keep thinking about the last four parties. I was like, mm, I'll go to the next one. And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> When the world opens up, we're going to all the parties. <laughs> That's what we're going to do. Uh, so what is something that you took for granted that you really, really wish you had, you know, done more of now that we've had to like, because I, I mean, I've been basically in a bubble since March. You know, um, yeah. what is something that you really, really missed that you wish you had done more of before this like sudden shutdown? I don't know if I wish I had done more of it because I did lot of it, which was spend time with my grandchildren. I have five grandchildren um, from like six to 18. And I love seeing them. They live like 15 minutes from my house. So that seeing them and being a part of their daily lives, you know, what are you doing? What'd you learn at school today? What all of that is like a, a fabric that um, that is delicate, but you do it every day, you do it every day. And then when you haven't seen them, you know, can't touch them, can't hug them for like six, eight months. It's just torturous, you know, and talking on the, you know, on the FaceTime and all of that. I do all that, but yeah. that's not the same, you know, so I miss, I miss that a lot, but it's, it's not so much that I regret, oh, I should have done more of it, you know, because I am a greedy grandmother. Anytime they will give me, <laughs> I'm right there with them. So I think less regret and more just looking forward to that on the other side when yeah. we went to all the parties. <laughs> right. And we're going to all the parties. I'm going to I'm going to have a party and just specifically invite y'all be like, we're having a party. Uh, you know, last year, last year for my birthday, I, I threw myself a birthday prom um, because I wanted to make poor choices on purpose. Um, and my friends just really wanted to dress up. So we like we literally tricked out the arts exchange. Uh, um, Paul Robeson Theater, and I had a DJ, and it was dance under the sea. It was super cheesy, 
and we had a prom and it was great. So uh, I'm definitely going to do more of that. What about you, Nick? What is something that you miss doing in the last <sighs> week? Like leisurely travel is a thing. And I, I find that like part of the reason I miss it is because I don't know, I'm such a workaholic, right? And like coming to realize that I had more time and more ability to do more fun stuff before, um, I'm like, dang, make sure that when you can't go back out into the world, you just like go to Disney World for the weekend. You know, like do doing things that aren't work related. Yeah. Um, with with other people think about that you know like i can i can go hang out with people in different places and it not be related to work so yeah. that's i think yeah, that's, that's so interesting that you say that because i think that's really a a thing that writers have to have to deal with because we have to be solitary at a certain point you have to stop you know drinking wine with your friends or drinking tea with your friends depending but talking about what the book is going to be what the play is going to be and you have to mm -hmm. actually let that go, put everybody out of the house and put those words on paper. And it's it's like, we we really need the balance of other people. You know, we're used to solitary time. So it's like, oh, at first I felt like this pandemic isn't gonna be bad. I spent so much time, you know, in my house, just, you know, writing anyway, that it won't be bad. But then I realized the balance is so critical. What you're saying, where you can have that solitary, I gotta be by myself with my brain. And then where you say, ooh, that I get to go and talk to some other people other than myself <laughs> for a day or two, you know, and see what else is happening in the world. And that's, I really, I do miss that. Um, just the ability to do it um, casually and you can't do anything casually right now. No. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a, a big thing for me. Like, like my, like my bubble include my son is staying with me. Right. But like for the first two months, we didn't, like physically hug or interact like that, you know, elbow bump maybe. And then one day he was just like, mom, I'm just going to take a chance. I just got to hug you. you know? so, so it's like, we can still do that. We're living in the same house together. Yes, yes. Yes. We're okay. Yeah, <laughs> then you can, you're all right. Then you're yeah, okay. As as we're yeah. being safe outside. We're, we're good, you know, yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but I think it's, it's, it's definitely changed how uh, I think we're going to interact with the world on the other side of this. And, and, you know, I think one of the things that I worry about with our young people is that, you know, um, relearning how to be social, you mm -hmm. know, how to, how to socialize with, with other people and resisting the urge to spray them in the face with Lysol, because I know I'm going to be really trying not to do that. <laughs> I think they'll be less likely to do that than we are, because I think they are, they are young, they are missing you know, being with other people in a way that, you know, when you're growing up, you miss it. But when you're like 12, you know, you're six, you're eight, all of those, you really, really want to be with your friends. And I think the the fact that they're inside with masks whenever they go out and all that, I think they'll be careful, but I think they're not going to be spraying people with Lysol. They're going to be like, can we hug now? Can we, mm -hmm. can we play? Can we right. play basketball? Can we, you know, have sleepovers, all that um, stuff and it's so uh, I think they'll be fine I think they are they're resilient and when people worry about oh my god they're out of school for a year it's like whatever the experiences they're having some are rich and enriching experiences and some are like kids are really scuffling to just keep up with what's going on but I think that on the other side of of the pandemic on the other side of this madness that we have coming from Washington there'll be a chance for people to recover and you know, become whole again and all of that because this is a this is a blip this does not have to be the way we live um together and it's uh you know i don't want to give a go out and vote speech but go out and go vote, out and vote. <laughs> vote. Yes. it's so important it's so important do it early do it by mail do it however you need to do it but you have to do it we have to take responsibility as as you know i think all of us are would call ourselves citizen artists you know we're all very engaged in talking to people about real things that happen um, in the world. And I think that's that's our job. That's what we have to do. Yeah. In a parking lot, in a theater, in right. a book, wherever you do it, you know, you gotta be saying, there is a truth and I'm trying to tell it. This is I like that. See, like, I, I, y'all are just making me feel so hopeful right now. Nick, what is your new project? And tell us about it. Um, so I had a book come out three weeks ago, actually the sequel to Dear Martin, um, Dear Justice. So this came out on the 29th of September. Y'all, it has been such a wild year with regard to like releasing 
work into the world. Um, Cause this was my third book this year. So the first one came out in January before everything shut down. The second one came out in May, just as everything was shutting down. So it just kind of got like lost in the wind. Um, and then this one, people have gotten used to the way things are going right now. So it's like doing really well. And it's, that's kind of an uncomfortable thing um, just because, I don't know, this has been a really funky year, uh, especially with regard to, you know, the spring and like things going on with George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and just this rush, this like racial reckoning, reckoning in the thick of a global pandemic. Like it's just been this like kind of year. Um, and it's, it's all very bittersweet to me um, because on the one hand, because of things going on in the country, books like mine sell really well right now. But the reason that they're selling really well is because of terrible things happening to people, you know? So it's just like the pandemic is giving this, it's creating this space where I just have way too much time to think about stuff. But I am glad that this is out in the world and that it's doing well. Um, so in Dear Martin, which Dear Martin's about, um, a 17 year old black kid who he gets racially profiled one night by a police officer and decides to start a journal of letters to the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, to see if Dr. King's teachings hold up now. And there's a character that you meet in Dear Martin who's kind of the opposite of the main character in character, like in character. So where the main character of Dear Martin is super high achieving, very academically inclined. Um, he goes to this bougie private school, is headed to Yale, captain of the debate team, all of those things. We learn about this other character who they grew up together in the same neighborhood, but where justice went one way, this other character went in a different direction. And so I wound up writing a book about that kid. And I wrote a book about that kid because I had two kids, two 16 year olds who had read Dear Martin, both boys, and while they loved that book, they loved that story, they wanted something that was a little bit more reflective of their actual lives. Like they're not going to Yale, right? So they wanted something that was a little bit more, that they could see themselves in a bit more. So Dear Justice is about a kid who's locked up. Um, it's actually about the kid who confesses to the murder of the cop who profiles justice and starts off Dear Martin. Um, and his name is Laquan. So yeah, it's weird. like it's out there and it's, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, I, I know that feeling of, um, that bittersweet feeling of like, like I me mean, as a performance artist and a, and a poet, all of my poems are social commentary, you know? Mm -hmm. So when the world shut down in March and like literally I watched over $2,000 worth of residency workshops just disappear. Yep. Um, I kind of went into the fetal position for a minute uh, we'll call it two months and um, was just like really just very angry. Like I've already written so many poems that say, please stop killing me. Yes. Stop killing us. Stop. I'm like, like I, 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 I can read poems that I wrote 15 years ago. Yep. And you would think that I wrote it last night. You know, um, I did my first slam virtually uh, in, 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 in a while. And I came in second, which was cool because I haven't done this in a while. I haven't slammed in a while, but again, pulled out a poem that I wrote years ago that could have been written yesterday, you know? Um, and that, so that makes you, it's like, oh, I know the poem did well because crazy things are happening in the world. Right. Um, but, but I also want to be able to write about other things. You know, yeah. um, I've been working on a YA novel for a while uh, called The Poetry Lady because that's what the kids call me when I go to teach their residency is they're like, we just go call you The Poetry Lady. I'm like, oh, whatever makes you, whatever makes it easy for you. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so it, but it's tricky and it's hard to kind of come to where these young people are and yeah. write about their experiences without actually being around them. So, you know, part of my note taking for this project is, you know, every year I do a residency in this particular school and these kids are amazing and, and you know, they're underserved, they're brilliant, uh, they're bold, they throw shade better than anybody I've ever seen. Um, they make comments like, you know what I like about you, Miss Teresa? When you talk to me, you look me in the eye, not over my shoulder, and I just watch the teachers turn red. So I'm like, yeah, that was for you. That was, that, I got used, but that was for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. 
but uh, but no, it's it's great. So so Pearl, you talked about the Collision uh, Project, right? Um, how was that this summer? Was it was it? I mean, did it go as as well? well I know it, it did, was, and and I I would love to say something about that, but I I want to just say to both of you that I hope that you can find a space to not feel guilty about um, your work being uh, embraced in a moment when people are confused. Because it's your work did not create the confusion. Your work did not create the police brutality. Your work is trying to grapple with what does it mean? What is the truth of being a young black boy living in a world where you don't feel safe? What is the truth of being a young black girl living in a world where you don't feel safe? What What is that? But it's not, um, your work is so um, beautiful. Both of you are doing such really honest thoughtful work that I just encourage you not to in any way feel guilty about, oh, the only reason they're buying my book is, you know, because now they're, they're scared because so much stuff happened. Fine. They'll find some useful information. They'll find some useful information in your poem. So the reason that they picked it up, because a lot of, you know, white people are picking up stuff because they feel guilty, but they should feel guilty because they haven't thought about this stuff. So don't you feel guilty about making them feel guilty? It's like, no, that's your job to tell the truth. And when they encounter it in whatever way, for whatever reason, it's like, that's a, that's a good thing. We have so many ways to sabotage ourselves as writers. We're so fragile in believing that we have the right to do this work. And I think black women feel this acutely do we have the right to do this work? And this work is inherently telling people to be quiet and listen to what I have to say. Feeling like your words and your the things that you think are true matter and you have the right to be heard. And we have a difficult time stepping into that space. Even when people embrace us and say, wow, that's interesting, talk more. We don't trust it. We're like, no, you only said that because, you know, but try to make yourself believe that they only said it found something that rang true in all this confusion and all of this madness they saw some glimmer of something that was true and they're rushing to it and I do understand how complicated it is I look at the, the New York Times bestseller list and I see, say if I see one more book titled fragility of white people how white people feel today how white people are dealing with police brutality it's like okay but that doesn't have anything to do with us as writers mm -hmm. or what we need to do so don't do it. Don't think about them as an audience. Think about how glad I am every time y'all do some work and just banish that from your mind. So that's my that's my grandmother's speech to y'all about confidence <laughs> at being young black women. You have to have that. Yeah. And the pandemic does make you look at everything differently. I recently accepted a commission to do a radio play. Because of course, you know, you're talking about workshops, production shut down, and you look around and say, how am I gonna make a living? This is what I do. Um, so that I got a commissioning to do a radio play, which I found very interesting because it lets you just focus on the sound of things, the words, mm -hmm. what are people saying? Um, what do you hear when you're walking through the woods at night? So that was very interesting to me. And I realized about halfway through it um, that I wanted to do it as a real play with real people um, in that plaza at the Woodruff Art Center. So it's it's kind of like you accept something because you're panicked because you want to work and this is a good way to do it. And then you realize, wow, this opens up a whole other way of thinking about um, the work that I do. So it's, uh, you know, yeah. that, that thing of getting up every day and pushing forward, you know, pushing forward. Yeah. yeah. Um, Nick, would you like to share a selection from your work and then Pearl? Uh, you can share after. And those folks in Facebook world, if you want to ask questions, um, if you can just type them into the chat. And um, if my eyes look like they're doing things, because I'm looking at two different devices at the same time. But um, yes. So any questions you have, just type them in the chat and I will communicate them with our panelists. Hey, Nick. Hey. All right. So I'll read. I'm going to read from Dear Justice. Um... Yeah, okay. Um, how long till they realize he's not who they think he is? Because he isn't. He's no scholar or visionary or future leader of America. He's a dumb kid who made a bunch of dumb decisions that have put him so deep in debt with everyone, it feels like drowning. Yeah, he loves his family more than life. 
and is good with numbers, but that doesn't compute to worthwhile investment of time, energy, and resources. But flip the script, Laquan, he can hear Tay saying in his brain the way she did in his last session. If you were me and I was you, would you invest in me as you? Yeah, he said without thinking twice. But why? Because it's you, obviously. She rolled her eyes, a nonverbal, you're missing the point, Laquan. But what if it wasn't me? What if it was a kid like you, one with your exact history? Quan had to think then, but not for long, because that answer was obvious too. I'd still invest. Invest what? Time, energy, resources. The next word shocked him as it popped off his tongue. It bounced around the room in an echoish way that the others had it. Belief? Belief? Yeah. Everyone should have somebody who believes in them, like no matter what they've done, somebody who won't give up on them, then no strings attached. He did get the point then. He was willing to do for someone else what was being done for him at no cost and with no strings. It was the right thing to do, period. Nice. Thanks. <laughs> I have a question before Pearl starts. So as an author, when, when, when your book is turned into an audio book, do you have any per se into who reads what? Do you have any decision part making in that? Oh, absolutely. Um, I picked, so the same narrate out of the six books of mine that have been published, everyone with a male narrator has the same narrator. Um, his name is Dion Graham and I just pick, he's amazing. So I pick him every time. I did, I narrated Jackpot myself and um, Anika Noni Rose did Shuri, which is like so cool because Princess <laughs> Tiana narrated my book about the little sister of Black Panther, like <laughs> geeks, <laughs> so geeks. Bro, did you choose who read your audiobooks? Um, well, I got to do most of them and yeah. on the others, maybe there were other two. I didn't, you know, they just, um, they, they told me who it would be, but I, I got to do most of mine. They made me send a, a tape to audition to see whether or not I could really do it. Um, so I did it. I was like, this is so weird. You have to audition to read your own book, but I understand because some <laughs> writers are not good at reading. You're but right. it was, um, so I got to read uh, most of them, but it was, it was fun. It was fun. Yeah. I enjoyed, I enjoyed it. I've been downloading a lot of um, a lot of books just to because I, I work better when I have background sound, but I don't work well with music. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It's, I feel weird when I do it. So I just listened to uh, re listen to uh, Lies I Told My Daughter. Um, mm -hmm. And 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 I was like, oh, OK, I, I actually remember some of these places. <laughs> some of these things. It was really, really cool, though. But it's great to have y'all's voices in my ear. Um, you know, and, and maybe like a word will come out and I was like, oh, I haven't heard this word in a lot while. And then I'll try to write with that word, uh, uh, create a piece with that word in mind. So, no, I want to thank you both for bo all of your work. But now, Pearl, I want to hear you read some work and what you got going. Um, I want to actually read a piece of the radio play that I was talking about. Okay. Um, and it's I'll, I'll read the setup and then just a, a piece of the this woman talking. Um, the woman is sitting on her front steps, awaiting the unannounced arrival of her brother and his girlfriend. She lives alone on a large piece of heavily wooded land just outside of Atlanta. It is night and the woods are full of appropriate night sounds, insects, nocturnal birds, barn owls, dry leaves on the ground. Her brother and his girlfriend are searching in the dark, some distance from the house, looking for something that does not belong to them. The sound of a screen door opening, a woman's soft footsteps on a creaky porch floor, a low rumble of far off thunder, the sound of a match being struck, the draw and exhale of a cigarette, woman. The smell of something dead blew in on the wind this morning. I thought at first it might be him, but no such luck. It's funny how I sometimes think about him dead, but never her. Passing counterfeit money is not a capital crime. Not that I ever think of killing him, not anymore, but people die of accidents and natural causes every day. He could be one of those, walking across the street and bam, game over. I always liked her. She'll do a lot better once she figures out how to stop lying. She's not very good at it, but if practice makes perfect, she will be. She's also gullible. Otherwise, why would she be out here with a loser like my brother, digging around in the dark like she believes this is Treasure Island and he's Long John Silver? 
pirate one, not the porno one. They've been digging out there for hours. No telling what they might find. There's lots of stuff buried in these woods. These are not really woods. If you walk less than five miles in any direction, you'll hit asphalt. But city people aren't used to the quiet. That's one of the reasons I live out here, for the quiet. It made my brother so nervous he stopped coming around. That's one of the other reasons I like it. The less I see of him, the better. But I can still smell him if he's headed my way, like tonight. I figured they'll be here within the hour. She probably has on heels, which will slow them down. Plus, they got to be careful of the hole, especially in the dark. That's the other thing my brother doesn't like, how dark it gets at night. There are holes all over the place. I dug them myself. When I first moved out here, I buried a bunch of stuff, personal stuff, jewelry too cheap to pawn, letters, two wedding dresses, a ring, stuff like that. But once I ran out of stuff I wanted to put in the ground, I realized the digging gave me more peace than the burying. So I just kept at it. Wow. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Thank you. I've been watching a lot of film noir old Hollywood movies. Yeah. And they're so uh, interesting to me because the women, the women are so bad. They are just bad. They lie. They do bad things. <laughs> and I think also as, as Black women writers, we always have that voice in our head that's like, you know, be good to the sister characters, you know, make these characters be good women. Even if they do bad things, they have a reason, you know, they have to have a reason. And in those film noirs, those women, they don't give you any backstory. They're just bad. And I'm, I love those movies. So I said, well, let me see if I can write a woman who kind of is hard boiled like that. Who can do <laughs> can it. I, write I never like write that? like that. And yeah. I had such a good time with this girl. She talks so much stuff. So I said, okay, <laughs> let me see if I can bring her to life right out there on the plaza, <laughs> outside of the Alliance Theater, what she's going to be talking about, burying stuff in the woods. Nice. So oh, I that, love it. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> is that the, one of the projects that you guys are going to do at the at the Alliance or? We are, we're gonna, we're gonna do it probably in the, in the spring when the weather is, is, you know, decent so that we can do it at, at night. Um, but I will definitely make sure that you all know since yes. this is the first time I've actually read it to anybody. So it was kind of like, great, I had a chance to, a to read it bodies. People to you all. Yeah, yeah, so. Gotta, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, it'll be on the radio and they'll have the sounds of the owls and all of that. That's excellent. So that was, awesome. Yeah. I do. I do think that you know, in our resiliency as 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 women, and especially as Black women, then and, and that 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 having to regrow yourself in different ways, you know, um, and and reach in different ways. And I feel like you know, for the most part, um, you've done it. I mean, I, I, I think both of you are. Um, you, you do multiple things, right? You write books, you write essays, you write poetry, you write um, all these things. What 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 do you? How do you decide? what direction your project is going to go, whether it's going to be an essay, whether it's going to be, you know, uh, littered with poetry. Do you make that decision beforehand or do you start writing and then just go where the writing takes you? I mean, for me, I'd say it's everything kind of happens beforehand. So like if I'm writing if I'm writing a short, because I have to plot everything out. Like I, I'm not, I can't, as much as I've tried to just like sit your butt in the chair and start writing, I, I can't do it. Um, so like, I have to have like a plan. And um, so if I'm writing an essay, I have like my bullet points that I write down before I write the essay. If I'm writing a short story, I have like the three, the kind of like three por the three points that need to happen for the arc to be complete. If I'm writing a novel, I have a full blown, chapter by chapter outline. Um, and honestly, that organization point is the most fun for me. Like right now I'm working on a few, this trio of pitches for a trilogy of books for Marvel comics, but for like adults. And just g reading comics and like watching old movies and doing all of this research to figure out how I'm going to compile these three stories. It's so much fun. Um, so like that, that space where the creative part is picking out disparate things and figuring out how you're going to put them together. Like, I love that part. Um, and that that's essays. That's if I'm writing a script, if I'm writing an essay, if I'm writing a short story, if I'm writing a novel, like all the process is the same across the board. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's, that's probably why it's taking me so long to write my book. I'm not that disciplined. Oh my I gosh. I'm sure about that. 
I'm like, I wrote five chapters. I don't even know if they go together. Yeah, it's fine. It's what revision is for, right? Yeah, as an yeah, editor, and, as an editor. Yeah, and people do it such different ways. You know, yeah. when you were when you were talking, um, I have to outline everything, and I have friends who just will sit down and start writing. But that would make me crazy, yes, because I wouldn't know where it was going. And you know, because when you have that wonderful phase you're, where you're just taking in stuff, it's like all of that is in there. But if you don't have an outline, how do you know how to pick through it? You know, right. I wouldn't. I that terrifies me. And I, you know, I try to do it. You know, because you feel like, okay, this is a Good thing. Let me just be free and just try to see if I can do it. And it's like, oh nope. no, this is not good. This is nope. not good. So I, I totally feel you. That's I do that too. Maybe it's a Spellman thing. We have to outline everything. You know, <laughs> hey, you're a so, choice you're to change the world. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I, I thought there was a question. Uh, no, this is a comment. Uh, Shirley Gomez says I discovered Miss Clegg in her Newport newspaper column. And then her movie, her novels, and Miss Davis through Grandchildren at Horizons. Oh, I taught somebody's kid. I used to be a teacher. I taught a lot of kids. But, uh, but uh, I, I love teaching. I have, I've had the opportunity to uh, create a curriculum around both of your work. Um, so uh, for Dear Martin, I had the pleasure of working with some middle schoolers uh, and, and, and interacting, with, interacting with the text to create their own poems or to, uh oh, Lost Pearl, what happened? What? To create their own poems or their own monologues for a character or an object, um, which is awesome. Let me see if I can find Miss Pearl. But yeah, but I, I do love doing that type of work. Um, whenever I get to interact or engage with uh, authors that I know um, and you know, get young people really excited about their work. It just really, it's something that, that's a fun part for me. So I, I can do curriculum all day long, but when I, when I start writing, I think the only time I've laid out my books of, of uh, for my poetry is I, I would take a wall and just put the post-it notes up there and like, this is going to go here and this is going to go here and then try to line the, the, the poems up so that they kind of do an arc thing. Yeah. Um, but it's poetry, so that's a whole different, a whole different thought process, I think. Um, but uh, we totally lost Pearl. Uh oh, and I she'll and come back. I think she's going to come back. Okay, she just has to reclick the link. Look, I have so much respect for you, also, just because, like, so as a novelist, as a person who writes prose, I find poetry as much as I eat it. Like, I I just love reading poetry, writing it. I'm like what do you mean I only have 25 words? Like, I, <laughs> I, I, what do you, I, I, no, I need 30,000. Like, what do you, it's, it's my, it blows my mind the things that people are able to achieve um, with poetry and, and the, the things you're able to do with language. I'm just floored by. So please keep up the excellent work, Ms. Davis. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I am behind on a, a project. My third book was supposed to come out uh, this fall, actually. Um, and I've got a lot of the poems for it. But like, yeah, when, when everything closed down, I just kind of had a moment of like, whoa, like, yeah, all my gigs, like, yep. I understand. Oh. Trust me, man. And then so so like everything's getting canceled. I had three months of, cause this was like Mar end of March. So like April, May, and June, all speaking engagements wiped out. Um, and yeah, that'll cause a little bit of writer's block. We're oh, yeah. like, oh, there goes all my money. <laughs> like, like I have, okay. So how are we gonna rec and so yeah, you just, and then my kids were home. And so I just kind of like took a few months and so another question, it says, do you outline for both fiction and nonfiction work? Yeah, I'm outlining for anything that has to be written. So interestingly enough, right, with nonfiction, because it's so topical, like depending on what the, what the thing is, if I'm writing a nonfiction essay, for instance, um, I will figure out what my points are going to be before I write the essay. That way I can kind of like weave in some narrative and actually make it like narrative nonfiction. So it's actually interesting to read. Um, and I'm about to do a, a nonfiction project that'll be a book. And this will be my first like nonfiction book. So it will be outlined meticulously. 
because the other thing is I write short, like I like writing short books. Yeah. Um, so with a shorter book, I don't have the space to just kind of figure it out as I go. Like I like having, I like to be succinct, to be succinct. And if I can be succinct, that gives me like, okay, you have 1500 words to describe what's happening in this chapter. And it'll be like that for fiction and for nonfiction. Yeah. Yeah. Hope that answered your question, Stephanie. Um, so yeah, so, uh, I guess we'll just chat until Pearl comes back. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, have you, have you been cooking more? Um, oh, I don't cook Teresa. No, ma'am. Mm -mm. No, no, no. There are things that Nick Stone is excellent at and things that we just don't do that. No, ma'am. Mm -mm. The last time I cooked, I gave myself food poisoning. So, um, like real talk. I don't know. I made something with shrimp or something. And I, thank God I was the only one who ate it because I did, I gave myself food poisoning. Wow. Yeah. No, I like to cook. Um, when, when my kids were younger, they, um, they knew that I would be, I get in cooking moods. Yeah. Right. So like, I don't cook every day, but like every once in a while, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to make an awesome pot of chili or I'm going to make a roast or something. And so they know to stay out of my way. And don't ask questions because you know because if I stop in the middle of making a meal, somebody else will have to pick it up because I don't it's like we don't gotta talk. get through. We gotta go all the way through. Straight yeah. shot. Yeah. So um what are some of the rituals that you do uh or you use for writing? Are you a morning writer? Do you write better in the afternoon or the evening? I am a write whenever I can. Um so when I first started pursuit of a writing career, I had like just had a kid. So I learned how to write with an infant. And, and so like, I can do that thing where if I'm sitting somewhere, I can pull out my computer and I can engage in whatever I was working on. Um, and that just comes from having to create in chaos right. for so many years still, like I still have to create in chaos. My kids are eight and four. So there is no quiet. <laughs> there is no, like, thank God they, they're actually back in school. Like my kids are, are in school. Okay. Um, and I'm glad, like, I'm glad that they're in school because now I do have a little bit more quiet and can, can do more. Right. So like, I'm able to produce more without them here, but even when they were here, I was having to kind of like find time to do what I needed to do. Um, yeah. So I do like to say, like sometimes I have to like turn off my Wi-Fi and throw my phone across the room in order to just stay engaged with the work because yeah. it's real easy to get distracted. That's my biggest thing is like distraction. And that's like one ritual where like phones over there. I can't access the internet. Yeah. I'm gonna sit here for an hour and just write for an hour straight. Yeah. Okay. So uh, do you give yourself uh, word limits for the day or word amounts? Like you have to do so many, do you schedule your writing like that? Pretty much. Pretty words. Yeah, I mean, it's sometimes it's a word count. Sometimes I just have to write a chapter. Um, sometimes it's like a page count. Um, I just finished a new project that will come out. It's a novel, a middle grade novel that will come out August 31st of next year. I, I, um, I wrote a Sandlot retelling about a softball team of black girls, of little black girls. Okay. And I had a lot of fun working on that book, but like my thing for each day, like I needed to write a chapter per day and like minimum five pages, maximum eight. So just writing five to eight pages a day. Um, and I got, I wrote it in like three weeks or so, three or four weeks, I wrote a draft. It's like, it's pretty short, it's 31,000 ish words, um, but it was fun. And it felt good to like, oh, I wrote a new book. This is exciting. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that that feeling of when you have something done and that and when you first get the, uh, the, the the author copy. I mean, I smell mine, but that uh -huh. one, oh, we all do that then, huh? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I'll get a little bit. <sighs> um, and be like, yes, it got out of my body. So now what else can I get out of my body? You know? Exactly. Um, so yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get back into that, but I'm one of those kind of people where I need to have like, I like to be able to sit with my thoughts for a minute and not writing or anything, just kind of be quiet and be still and, you know, and then I can collect myself. But I write, I find that I write better uh, when I'm pissed, which is bad, but also good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
But so yeah, lately it's and, and lately I've been so angry all the time. It's yes. just like, you know, a human being should not be able to like have the capacity to be so angry and righteously so all mm -hmm. the time. You know, yep. um, you know, my, my my you know, my kids are older and so like with all this happened with all the the the, the race racial reckoning i guess is what we're calling it now uh like it just realized oh what we're racist we didn't know i didn't know that was real anymore and I, like the the number of conversations i've had to have recently with people who just have been utterly oblivious it has been like, and, and I am right there with you. I am able to write from like that rage because I can't do anything with it out in the world. Like yeah. I have to channel it into something and, yeah. and it, it does it, it, I say, I turn my rage, I turn my anger into money, um, by writing it down in a form, in the form of story and, and letting people decide they're going to read it. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, I think that's that's a good plan for for most authors and art, artists. Period. You know, because yeah. uh, I was always brought up. You know, with my my artistic fan artistic family, I was already always brought up to create art, and art is not supposed to be this like go down easy kind of thing. It's no. supposed to make you think about something. It's supposed to make you want to react in some way. Um, so I was, I was always taught that, you know, my art is going to make other people uncomfortable and that's yep. okay because that's, that's maybe what's supposed to happen right now, you Absolutely. know, it's supposed to be uncomfortable. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so Pearl, what, what is, what is your writing ritual? Are you a morning writer, an afternoon writer or where, whenever the buzz um, hit? Since the, since pandemic, I'm starting a little later. Um, but I like to write it early in the day. Uh, so I usually try to get started somewhere between 10 and 11 um, and then write till about five, six, really. Um, and then try to wrap up whatever it is so that I can, you know, hold my head and watch the news at 630. Uh, <laughs> but I, I like to write every day. I don't write on Sunday, but I like to write it every day, especially if I'm involved in something because it keeps it alive in my head um, to do the work on it every day. And when I'm not working on something big, then I try to make sure I write in my journal to, you know, to not just be doing business, but to also, you know, what do you see out the window? What are you thinking about? But I was going to ask that next. Do you do you journal as well, Nick? Oh, absolutely. I I think I would probably die without journaling. Like genuinely. Like I started. I've been journaling since I was very, very, very young. And part of the reason Dear Martin is written the way that it is, um, is because when I first heard about the death of Jordan Davis in 2012. I just wanted to write, like I wanted to write, I like needed to journal. And so this idea of this kid keeping a journal in the form of letters, like that came out of kind of my own journaling tradition. Cause I used to write letters to God when I was like in middle and high school. Um, I would journal in the form of letters to God. And it was always so helpful with just processing, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I journal. My, my my I try to get my kids to journal. I, don't, I think they jot things down when they think about it. Um, but I I have not been journaling as much as I would like to. Um, mm -hmm. um, because I feel like everything would be like curse word, curse word, curse word, curse word. Okay. Um, <laughs> cool. <laughs> I'm like, look, that's cool. Go for it. That's right. <laughs> do what you gotta go do. Go <laughs> get it out. Yeah, you know, yeah. So I was saying, um, Pearl, when, 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 we, when we lost you for a minute, but you're back there. I know, it was like, ah, technology. Um, but, uh, <laughs> so I, I, I have had the, uh, I have had the pleasure, pleasure of working with uh, Nick's work and your work in the classrooms. Um, and so, you know, like for uh, Angry Raucous and Shamelessly Gorgeous, um, I was on the, I, I taught dramaturgy um, with uh, the students at Lab Atlanta. Um, and when I tell you, uh, it's so cool to have to have these ki kids like look up words that they've never heard before. And it's like, wait, there's a word for that? Yes, there is a word for that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and connecting with the history of Atlanta, like so many of them didn't know what Pascal's was, mm -hmm. um, didn't know uh, anything about Casper Hill area. Um, cause they're so in their own little bubble. So doing this work and being able to take 
your work into these schools and, and kind of like break it down so that they can interact with it more. Um, it's been it's been such a joy for me. Like whenever whenever Alliance is like, you want to you want to work with Pearl stuff? I'm like, yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, I love whenever I get a chance to to do that. And at the Arts Exchange, with with me doing the literary programming, part of what I would like to do here is create like little salons for young people um, in, in East Point to come and and you know learn some writing workshop stuff. You know, learn how to write. Um, in different ways. Maybe you're maybe you're a script writer or a film writer or a play writer. You don't know until you try something. Because I, I know, you know, as a kid, when you're a, a kid of creatives, like back when, when, when I was coming up, like every summer program that was offered at the museum, we was in it. Every, you know, a, anything that, that, that was, here's another way to do art, here's another way to explore art, here's another way to, to, to be artistic, we were there. Um, and so with my kids, I've always kind of been like, um, you know, don't knock it till you try it. So you yeah. try it one time. If you don't love it, you don't have to do it, but you might love it, you know. Um, and as a result, you know, my daughter ended up being in uh, YEA Youth Ensemble Atlanta uh, for years. And then, you know, has become an actor and was actually recently understudy in Pearl's play that I got to do dramaturgy for. So it's like it all comes around full circle. Right. And, and that's. You know, when things happen like that, you're like, I'm living the right life. I'm doing the right things. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> when you yeah. said I knew all that hard work was taking me where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I know I know your play was supposed to be, be touring now. Um, have y'all have y'all discussed how that's going to look on the other side, or have you considered making it into a film? Well, um, some of the theaters have have told me that they when they reopen they want to you know reschedule the play, which would be great. Um, I'm not a filmmaker, so I haven't really uh, tried to pursue uh, making films. I have great respect for filmmakers, but I'm not visual like that, so that um, that I really have not um, have not pursued that. But I'm I've been very uh, gratified by the fact that that all of the theaters who had committed to do it, um, which was like seven, eight productions, which would have been great, but the pandemic canceled all of that. But they all are interested in once we can open these theaters or figure out another way to do it, that they want to do it. So I'm not going to try to say it'll never be on the stage. I'll figure out some other, you know, way to have it live. I still think it has a life. Yeah. No, and I, and I have faith that that we're going to eventually get back to too. Uh, uh, a place of normal. See, it won't be normal because, you know, so many other things have to be addressed. But I, I do believe that the, the, the United States has kind of been poised to be where it is right now, as far as race goes, and as far as you know, um, you know, I, I just I don't know. Did y'all watch Great Game of Thrones? My favorite scene is when Homegirl just tells the dragon to just burn it all down. It's like I feel like something has to happen in order for us to reset. Yeah. Um, and what that reset looks like, you know, I'm very hopeful for some things, but that's going to be hard. It's going to yeah. be hard. Yeah. Um, so are there any parting words of wisdom and love that you would like to give to the world? And also let us know where we can order your book so that you get most of the money. <laughs> I mean, look, my royalty rate's the same no matter where you get them from. So <laughs> anywhere, Perfect. Target, Walmart, um, Barnes and Noble. My personal suggestion is to hit your local independent bookstore. Um, if you are in Atlanta, my favorite is Brave and Kind Books in Decatur. It is black owned and it's amazing. Um, the owner's name is Bunny and she is just an absolute delight. Um, parting words, if you're breathing, you're doing good. Like you're doing amazing. So let that breath be something to celebrate. Mama Pearl. That's lovely. I like that a lot. Um, I would say uh, support independent bookstores. Um, I love Karis, which is one of the mm -hmm. last remaining feminist bookstores in the country. Um, but Karis Books is always wonderful and, and has our books all the time. Um, I would say uh, for, for parting words, just um, stay safe, um, and, but stay strong. Don't be afraid. Um, and be very bold, you know, get out there and vote, take some people with you to vote. Um, don't be afraid of what this next phase is going to be, because it's going to be 
crazy and there's probably going to be some kind of violence on you know on the horizon but you know we've lived through the clan we've lived through all kinds of racial violence so that that's not a reason to stop pushing forward you know i think that just be very bold have the the courage to to keep it moving do your small part just keep it moving yeah yes please go vote uh, i've been doing a, a series of uh children's stories for fun uh when it just gets too much and so i'll read a a, a book about uh, how to how to how to hide an octopus and it's a very yep. you know kitty book and then at the end i was like you know what this sounds like a great idea for you to go and vote and then i just kind of go off for three or four minutes uh it's not it's not an arts exchange program because i <laughs> i I do not hold back the words. Um, but yeah, voting is very, very important. Uh, my son voted for the first time. Um, uh, you know, he just turned, he just got to the age where there, and an election is happening and he was very, very excited about that process. And so I'm like, everybody take somebody to vote, go vote. Um, yeah, it's so it's so important. And um, we've got, we've got a lot of growing and a lot of changing and a lot of, things coming, but, you know, I think that Black women have power that, you know, we haven't yet unleashed, and it will mm -hmm. be unleashed it. Um, I know that's not a word, but I just said it, and I made it one. Hello. Yep. <laughs> um, but I want to thank you all so much. This was delightful. I enjoyed talking to you both so much. Um, and um, maybe we'll do it again because all this work that's coming out, we got we got more. There you go. About. This was lovely. Thank you so yeah. much for for having us. It was thank you so. It much was lovely you. to be with y'all on this rainy afternoon. Thank you so much. Same. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, those listeners, thank you all for listening and and uh, chiming in. Uh, you've got a lot of love, 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 love. So when y'all go back and look at the comments, you can see all the love. Uh, not a lot of questions, more like, I met Pearl and she did this and I'm inspired and my middle, <laughs> my daughter's middle name is Pearl. And um, so yeah. I'll take all it, I'll love, take it. All the love. Um, but yes, um, you are watching the Arts Exchange author panel. Thank you for hanging out with us. Please, please, please go vote and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you so much, Pearl. Thank you, Nick. Bye. Bye.